This morning we'll be reading from Psalm 139. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and me lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light around me become night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth, your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me, when none of them as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! I try to count them. They are more than the sand. I come to the end. I am still with you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be be to the Lord our God. Amen. Amen. O Lord, you search me and know me, for you formed me. There is a beauty and a power in these words, a beauty and a power that echoes across time. It's one of those things I love about scripture in general and the Psalms in particular. The ability of the Holy Spirit to speak to us at different times using the same words. I suspect many of us have had that experience of picking up scripture and hearing something new in our life than the last time we picked up that same scripture. We have a living scripture, and I love that. And so when I heard the words of this psalm as it was planned for worship, and when I realized I would be preaching this morning, I remembered how these words had resonated with me in a different time and a different place. The main outline of the message I'm going to share this morning was originally one I shared with a congregation in Jefferson, North Carolina in 2011, a small community in the rural mountains of northwestern North Carolina. Some of you might know that that's where I spent the three and a half years right after I finished seminary, a place where I uh, got my start in ministry, a place where I learned to love Um, Some place I had never visited before I interviewed there. It was a small community, yes, smaller than Kirksville. um, County-wide population of about 25,000. The town itself was about 1,000 people. And this was a community that at the time was struggling with issues around mental health. Struggling to find ways to speak into a darkness that seemed to be enveloping far too many in our community. And so a community group had formed and with several churches as partners and designated one Sunday out of the year to talk openly about mental health, to speak into the pain and darkness, to put away the stigma, and to offer hope. Now we are not Jefferson, but most of us know that our Kirksville community and our Northeast Missouri community have our own struggles. We know our children and our youth and our college students struggle with mental health. And simply, statistically speaking, we know that most of us in this room have either experienced anxiety or depression or we're close to someone who has. So perhaps now, more than ever, we need to speak plainly. We need to know that we are all seen, that we are all known, that we are all loved, and that there is hope for our world. 
because we know that we look around at the news sometimes and we're not quite, quite sure where that hope is. So perhaps this morning, these ancient words of this psalm can speak to us, can resonate through the centuries, can speak to us in new ways, for there is hope. There is hope because God knows us, knows us intimately, and does not ever allow us to walk alone. God created us, created us to be in community with one another. And God loves us even when that darkness sometimes threatens to overwhelm us. The writer of the psalm says, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. We have been made by our loving God. Another translation says, we are awesomely and wonderfully made. God made us with care and reverence. Remember that image, the image that we've talked about the last several times I've preached, and I didn't actually insert this, this was here, that image of God taking the dust in Genesis and breathing life into it. There's reverence in that image. God reverently created us. One preacher has said, each of us was wondrously, strikingly, remarkably, differently made in ways that are beyond human explanation. God created us so that we are unique in the ways that we hear and see and experience and respond to our world. How amazing is that? I know we are often worried about diversity, how we are different, but how amazing is it that God endowed us with unique characteristics and that God loves us simply and powerfully because we are God's good creation. Let that sit for a second. We are loved simply because God created us and loves us. Nothing, nothing can ever change that. There is hope in that. There is also hope because the God who created us didn't simply create and step back. God who created us knows us, intimately knows us. Oh Lord, the psalmist says, you have searched me and know me. You have searched me and know me. God dwells with us. One translation says, oh Lord, you dig me. You know, I didn't write that one. Another says, O Lord, you have excavated me. Let that sit for a second. You see, when the world around us rushes so fast, and when we rush so fast that we barely get acquainted with our neighbors, yeah, I'm talking to myself. I met a neighbor the other day that uh, has lived there long enough that I should have known his name by now. When we rush so fast that we barely know who is around us, God knows us. When family or friends can't seem to understand our joys and our sorrows, God knows us. When you meet a friend or a fellow church member at Hy-Vee and they say, hi, how are you? And you respond, good, thanks, as you sail down the aisle while trying to hold back the tears and the honest answer, God knows you and loves you. When you are walking in the darkness and can't seem to feel the love of friends and family that you intellectually know is there, God knows and loves you. When you see a friend struggling and can't seem to let them know that you care, God loves you and knows you and loves them and loves you. You see, God is endlessly fascinated by God's good creation and continues continually to get to know us. This is the God for whom no one is anonymous, the God for whom there is no lost sheep or lost coins. God knows us. That is amazing. The psalmist continues, You know when I sit down and when I rise up. O Lord, you share coffee with me when I pour out my heart. O Lord, you know my thoughts as I struggle to sleep at night, and you know my thoughts as I rise and prepare for a new day. How wonderful is it to be truly known. In a world that teaches us to look without truly seeing and to hear without truly listening, how wonderful is that to be known and loved by the one who knows us better than we know ourselves? 
that, my friends, is also a fearful thing. It is a fearful thing to be known. It is difficult and painful to allow ourselves to be excavated, to allow our wounds to be exposed, touched, prodded, healed by God. It is hard to allow ourselves to be exposed to others. It is difficult to allow someone, even God, to see and touch the raw places in our lives. It is difficult to allow even God to walk with us in the light and through the darkness. But God, God is the light, and God does enter the darkness with us, whether we have given our permission or not. God is with us. There is never a moment we are alone, whether we are aware of it or not. The psalmist says to God, if I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. On my good days, Lord, you are there. When I am joyous and soaring high, you are there, O Lord. When I am down and feeling as though the forces of death and chaos of our world may overtake me, you are there, O Lord. That is the promise and the hope that I hope we affirm this morning. And please know that that affirmation does not minimize the reality of pain and suffering. Our pain is real. Our neighbor's pain is real. The forces of chaos and death in our world that we hear about on the news is real. But we can encounter those things in the knowledge and hope that the God who breathes life into us, knows us, and searches us, and loves us, and walks with us. And because we have this hope, because we are known and loved by God, because God walks with each of us, we are called into community, a community of love that also knows each other, loves each other, walks with each other in the times of joy and through the times of darkness. Reminded of a scripture that we've explored relatively recently from 1 John. Love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. God's love was revealed among us. God sent his only son into the world. And this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loves us. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. This is the community of love we call the church, the body of Christ in the world. Now, living in community is hard work. It's not easy, I know that. Loving each other well, especially in the times of darkness, is not easy. The body of Christ was broken just as we were broken, and there was pain and death. But We also know there was resurrection on that third day. So how? How do we love each other well? It's easy for me to stand up here and preach, but how how do we do this? And someday I'd love to hear that answer, your answer to that question, as we talk amongst ourselves after worship. But I do know two things. To love each other well, we must truly come to see each other, just as we are seen by God. We must truly come to know each other, and in so doing, We allow ourselves to be vulnerable, to be seen and to be known. It's not easy, but it's good work. We often do this best through storytelling. Those of you who have heard me preach know that I really don't think of myself as a preacher as much as a storyteller. And so I share just a piece of my own story this morning, my own story of the power of community. Many of you know that I grew up in the United Methodist Church, UMC born and raised What you might not know is that I was privileged to be a part of the same congregation from when I was baptized to when I left for college and came here. Um, During those years, as I was growing up, my mother struggled with depression in the same way that her mother had years before, in a time when we didn't understand mental health treatment as well as we do now. Those years were not always easy. But I knew without a doubt that the people of God were surrounding my family with love. I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that if I needed support, God's people would be there. Now, we weren't a perfect congregation. But there were two or three people 
who took the time to truly get to know me, to truly look and see and listen, and listen beyond my standard answer of, I'm fine, thanks. It was an amazing gift, still is to this day. That's part of my story. Happy to talk more about it later. But what's yours? What's ours? To be seen is powerful. To be heard is powerful. To be vulnerable with each other is hard and difficult, but powerful. What's our story? Our story as the body of Christ in this place. How do we love each other well? In many ways, you all do that in ways that Scott and I don't even see. You give people rides to church. You check in with those who are grieving. You share joys and concerns with each other. You pray for each other. And, of course, we share food. <laughs> we break bread together all the time. We get to know each other. Beyond those, I know one more thing. That we love each other well. When we listen beyond that standard answer in the aisle of hy or Walmart, or the square, or in the church pew. How are you? I'm doing well, thanks. We love each other well when we listen beyond that. We love each other well when we refuse to give that answer. We love each other when we don't hold back those tears. We allow others to care for us. That is not easy. I know it is not easy, but it is important, and it is spirit-led is one way that we become the body of Christ, broken and redeemed. It is one way we help each other and our wider community through times of challenge and darkness. It is one way we help our children and our youth and our college students as they struggle. It is one way that God creates bonds of love that cannot be broken. Each week, we gather around this table, this table that mimics, maybe mimics not quite the right word, this table that reminds us of the tables that we sit around when we share fellowship meals. We share our stories with each other when we love each other well. We're not going to gather around this table this morning for communion for two reasons. The first being a somewhat practical reason, but um, gives me an opportunity to talk about something I love otherwise known as, why does Reverend Jennifer wear this odd stole? Yes, it's a stole, not a beauty sash. Pastor Scott is an ordained elder in the United Methodist Church. I'm an ordained deacon. We are both ordained. We are ordained to slightly different roles and identities. In our denomination, we ordain elders to preach and teach and lead worship and preside at the sacraments of baptism and holy communion. We ordain deacons to preach and teach and lead worship and assist at the sacraments, and also to ministries of compassion and justice that connect what we do in worship here to what all of you do during the week, to building bridges between the church and the world. And so today, yes, Scott's not here, so practically this is an easy or way to not have communion. But I also want us to hear this morning that part of what we're called to do each and every week is to take what happens here out there. So as we gather around the tables, as we eat donuts out there, as we share food downstairs, as we hold a cup of coffee, I want to challenge us to truly see each other, to truly know each other, to truly love each other, to listen well. It begins here, but it really happens out there. Sometimes we think the action's in here. It's actually out there every day of the week. There is a tradition that I encountered when I was in North Carolina. It's in our Methodist tradition called the Love Feast. It actually came into Methodism from the Moravian Church when John Wesley encountered some Moravians in his, in his travels. It is not a sacrament, but it is a meal symbolic meal that reminds us of gathering around family tables. So some churches do this actually as part of worship, where they have sweet rolls and coffee, and they pass them down the aisles as a special service, and then they turn to each other, and they talk, and they share, and they listen. Don't worry, I'm not doing that. I'm enough of an introvert to know that that would make many of us very nervous. 
But my challenge is, as we pray our prayer of confession in just a moment, and as we leave this space, that we don't simply leave and go back to the way things are, but we go back and we talk and we see each other. We ask, how are you doing? And we wait to hear the answer. And we love each other knowing that God loves each of us. Let us pray.